guess we'll, uh, guess we'll What's start. your transportation, start. Carol? We, one hopes, one hopes. Uh, thank you all for coming. My name is Steve Popak. I'm the executive director of the Rappaport Institute. Uh, pleased that all of you could join us here tonight. Um, it's a great topic and um, promises to be a very interesting talk. Uh, I just want to briefly uh, introduce you to the Rappaport Institute for folks who may be newcomers here. Uh, Rappaport Institute does three things. We do fellowships for graduate and PhD students. Um, to give them the opportunity to work in the public sector um, here in Massachusetts and specifically in Greater Boston. We also um, do research projects where we commission, commission research on topics of interest to Greater Boston. And we have conversations like we're going to have here tonight on issues um, of importance to the region. And uh, we're grateful for all of you for coming and joining us. We're also grateful to Dana Levinson uh, for joining us. Dana is the chief financial officer of MassDOT. So not only does he have oversight of the state's airports, highways, and transit systems, he, as well as the RMV, um, he also oversees MassDOT's real estate and asset development initiatives. Um, he's originally from Worcester. Previous to working as MassDOT CFO, he was the managing director and head of infrastructure banking for the Americas for the Royal Bank of Scotland. So he's, he, he brings to us uh, experience both on the public and private side of transportation infrastructure. He was previous uh, to be previous to his time with RBS. He was the CFO for the city of Chicago. Um, and one of the many things he did in that job was uh, he was responsible for the long-term leases of both the Chicago Skyway and the Chicago downtown parking system. Previous to that, he held uh, managing directorships with Bank One and Bank of the Americas, um, spent more than 11 years with Kidder Peabody, and began his career in finance with Chemical Bank in New York. He holds an MBA from New York University and a bachelor's in European history from Brown University. And we are grateful um, for his presence here today. Uh, we look forward to his talk. And please join me in welcoming Mr. Levinson. Thank you. Steve, I appreciate the introduction, but there are two corrections. Uh, number one, um, I'm responsible for the financial oversight, financial part. not the operational oversight of uh, the RMV, the highway division, aeronautics, etc. cetera. Uh, and it is Worcester. Not Worcester. <laughs> please, please. I, I may have left for 37 years, having returned about a year ago, or a little over, but I know how it goes. In any case, um, thank you all for being here tonight. Um, I'm going to try and I'm going to talk about a lot of things, and it's probably going to be a little bit disjointed, and I apologize in advance for that. We have right now going on uh, in the Commonwealth um, a, uh, a discussion uh, with the state legislature uh, about transportation. Uh, transportation in the Commonwealth, trains, planes, and automobiles. Um, we are strapped for resources, like every other Department of Transportation in the country. We have massive challenges like every other Department of, Tra of Transportation in the country. Uh, we happen to have the oldest uh, transit system in terms of the T, so therefore we're number one. I can't talk about the rest of the country. Um, but it is a, it's a time when, based on the conversation that we've had with the public, with our customers, the legislators, this is the time for us to act. And the need is immense. We have a, as part of the program, we are putting forth a $13 billion, what we call accelerated transportation program, which speaks to the state of good repair. It speaks to expansion. I'd say the ratio between, uh, the ratio of state of good repair to expansion is about 75%, 25%. Take the 13 billion and do the math. We are pouring most of the money that we're asking for from the state legislature into the existing system. But I think as everybody knows, transportation infrastructure is capital intensive, meaning it costs a hell of a lot of money to run the trains, to make sure the highways are smooth, 
to make sure that the assets are running to the satisfaction of our customers, the users of the assets. We also know that there has to be expansion because transportation is part of the economic engine. It's one of the driving forces of the economic engine. And without good transportation, without good roads, without good trains, without good transit, without good RTA buses, we will not expand our economy. It will contract. We are facing a situation that is quite tough, not insurmountable. It will cost. It will cost everybody in this room. Uh, but on the other hand, I think that if you look at the product that you're buying, you'll agree that the cost is not that high, even on an incremental basis going up. But I'm not here to campaign for the way forward, uh, which we call the plan for transportation in the 21st century. What I'm also going to do, what I'm going to try and do is crosswalk, which is one of my favorite terms, the new buzzword of the day. I'm going to crosswalk what we are looking for in terms of fixing transportation in Massachusetts with innovative financing techniques. Innovative financing techniques being the way that we get money. Because there are all sorts of ways that we can try and get money to finance the assets that we need to repair, the assets that we need to build, the assets that we need to buy. And it's not just raising taxes, it's not just, it's not just, uh, uh, not just uh, uh, issuing municipal bonds. Go to the buzzwords. Do you want to just hit the floor? Yeah. Where am I pointing? I might have um, gone to sleep. So just oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Okay, buzzwords. You'll hear a lot about these tonight. I just used the word crosswalk. And what we're trying to do at, at 10 Park Plaza in downtown Boston, we were trying to crosswalk this plan to the budget that we're putting forth, the plan for $13 billion in accelerated transportation projects that we think are incredibly important to the Commonwealth. What's infrastructure? The conventional definition, I wrote this down, hard assets, expensive, that serve a country, city, or other area with fundamental facilities and or systems. The market definition of infrastructure is a bit different. The market definition, I'm here we're talking about investors in infrastructures as well as users of infrastructure. The market definition of infrastructure are assets with high barriers to entry that are monopolistic or quasi-monopolistic, and they can be as well run by the private side as by the public side. Just keep that in mind when we talk about innovative financing techniques when it comes to infrastructure. Public-private partnerships. I love the alliteration. It just rolls off the tongue. And if you said, what's the definition of a public-private partnership? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's the term that has launched a 1,000 conferences and very few deals, at least here in the United States. Public-private partnerships, however, outside of this country are thriving. Whether you're talking about Canada, if you're talking about the UK, if you're talking about in France, public-private partnerships can be a euphemism for privatization. And caveat, I am not here advocating mass privatization. I'm sure there may be some, some of you that think so, that's not the case. But there are situations where privatization can be a positive development when it comes to providing infrastructure assets for the use by its customers, its users, the people who pay for it, the taxpayers, and others. Uh, the last, I'm going to turn to the last page. The great quote <coughs> by Mario Cuomo. It's not a government's obligation <coughs> to provide the services, but to see that they are provided. So keep that in mind as we talk about infrastructure, assets, what can be done, what's different about today's market, and there's always been a market for infrastructure. At one time, it was just the state that paid for it, and the users said fine. But unfortunately, we've gotten to the point where states don't have nearly as much money as they did in the late 50s when the interstate system was put in across the country under Eisenhower. Uh, we don't spend as much on infrastructure as we used to. We don't spend as much on infrastructure 
as a percentage of GDP, as many, many other countries still continue to do so. Our roads and our bridges, the useful life that was intended when they were built, call it 1957, the year that I was born, they were built for roughly 65 year average useful life. Guess where we are right now? We're at 65 years. Now that doesn't mean that they all fall down you know, on the 66th birthday. But if they haven't been maintained, as they should have been, because again, we're spending less on infrastructure as a percentage of GDP than we ever did, ever have in the past, we are having problems with our infrastructure. We have subway cars that are roughly 22 years old. The useful life on a subway car is about 21 years. We have not replaced them when we should. We have some that are much older. We have some that have been on, that, that have been on the track since uh, 1980. Uh, and, and actually some on the Green Line that are even older than that. And they look it. And we have problems. They have to be replaced. But how much does it cost to replace a subway car? I can tell you that a locomotive is around five and a half million dollars. We have 41 locomotives uh, in the system. We need 41 locomotives replaced very soon. Yes, thank you very much. This is exactly right. So you start adding all this stuff up. I assume that it now comes as no surprise that the price tag for both maintaining the system and the expansion projects, and we're talking, I'll get the expansion in a moment, is at least $13 billion. In fact, if you look at the State Transportation Infrastructure Plan, the infamous STIP, which tracks a large chunk of infrastructure projects, a lot of which get reimbursed by the federal government, and you take the STIP and you take all the other lists, if you will, of things that we would like to see done, some of which have to be done, it's probably around $28.5 billion. So what we're proposing now, and I'm getting back to the idea of the way forward, a 21st century transportation plan, which if it, I have four copies here, it's not, you can get on, on our website, but if you want to take a look, you'll see lots of numbers, lots of different assets that we're talking about. You take the, you take the transportation plan that we're looking at, $13 billion, plus 13 plus billion, plus the capacity that we have already programmed into the system. If we did nothing, we would be spending four and a half to $5 billion on infrastructure anyways, based on how we do our business, just the four and a half to five billion isn't, isn't anywhere, anywhere near enough. So we're looking at $20 billion worth of infrastructure projects that we plan on putting forward to the state legislature that we need to do. This isn't just what we'd like to do, the nice to haves, these are the need to haves. We think that this is a transformational time. The, the discussion that was about this time last year when we were talking about service cuts and fair hikes. It was an ugly discussion. It was not fun for anybody. But if you consider what we were talking about at that time, which was around $160 million of an operating deficit at the T, that's nothing compared to the $13 billion at a minimum that we need to be putting to work in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to fix our transportation assets and to maintain them correctly. But public-private partnerships, there's simply a way to finance that 13, part of that $13 billion. We're not saying privatize everything. We're not saying privatize $13 billion worth of assets. In fact, I'm not even sure that you could privatize a whole lot in Massachusetts. Um, and that's because there aren't that many cash-flowing assets. There are some. Um, but the idea of a, a public-private partnership where you are talking about a publicly-owned asset that is financed and operated by the private side, there is the ability based on an investment thesis that is in the market now that there may be ways to solve certain transportation problems, but by no means all of our transportation challenges. But we need to keep an open mind when it comes to financing because you know, frankly we know how much $13 million is going to cost and as I said earlier, everybody in this room assuming that you are living in the state of Massachusetts, um, it's going to be more expensive. There's another buzzword that, we're, that we hear these days, um, value capture. 
Value capture is much newer than public private partnerships. Value capture is where you put up the money to build something. What you're building attracts investment from the private side, whether it's real estate or housing or other types of development. There are increased taxes that are generated by these businesses. And then you can bring some of that back to pay for what you financed in the first place. Value capture is a very, very novel concept. There's a conference in about three weeks, and someone asked me to talk about it. I said, I can't. I don't know really what it is. I said, what I'd rather do is sit in the audience and hear someone who was actually engaged in value capture with numbers and says, here's the value capture. Here's how we got back 80% uh, of, uh, of the 500 million that we used to finance this particular project. But you'll hear more about value capture. It's a reasonable concept. But again, what we're trying to do is a culture. What I'm trying to do is acculturate you to the conversation that is taking place at large, which is very diverse. It is difficult to get your arms around, but not impossible by any stretch. If I can do it, you can do it. But again, keeping in mind that what we need to have for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and every other state DOT talks exa exactly like this, but I don't think they're being nearly as active as we are. We are saying we need to fix our stuff that needs to be fixed, and we need to expand. What is the transportation system that we have? Oh, that was on. Hurry on. We have one, two, three, four, five operating divisions. Highway, everybody knows. We used to have the, uh, the, the turnpike authority, and then you had the mass highway system. Um, when the snowplow reached the end of the turnpike and there was a highway to go on to plow, that operator did not do it because he wasn't employed by the turnpike authority. Um, we have 11,000 plus roads that are state highways, including the Mass Pike. 11,000 plus miles of state highway roads. Um, and the Mass Pike, 160 miles? Anybody know for sure? But uh, just to give you an idea of just exactly how many road miles we are responsible for, we have about 4,000 people in the highway division. I'll get to more specifics in a moment. Aeronautics, we have Massport. I'm not really talking about Massport tonight, that's a separate authority. Uh, Massport is Logan, Hanscom, and Worcester, and it is the Port of Boston. It also owns a lot of land in really neat places. Aeronautics is also, at MassDOT, by the 39 general aviation fields. I bet a lot of people didn't realize that there are actually 39 general aviation fields in the Commonwealth which generate $1.2 billion in FY in, 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 in 2012 of economic activity based on direct jobs and indirect jobs. You go to Barnes, there's a, lock, there's a general dynamics uh, facility that just opened up uh, that's there to service uh, Gulfstream corporate jets. Um, it's a good business. Uh, it's a very good business for that area of the economy. It employs a lot of people. Rail and transit. This is not the MBTA, that's next. Rail and Transit. Transit are the RTAs. There are 15 of them across the state. <coughs> Worcester Regional Transportation Authority, Brockton, Pioneer Valley. Um, I can't name any others, um, but they are there. And they run the, they run the buses. Uh, the Rail Division is Cape Cod Rail, which are ser service which are just starting up. We think that is going to be a profitable service that subsidizes other rail services that, that we have in the Commonwealth. There is um, the Knowledge Corridor, which runs uh, north to south. Um, we have projects such as Springfield to New York Rail that we'd like to put in because we think that there's a market there. Um, the Rail Division is extremely capital intensive, uh, but very active. The MBTA, everybody knows about the MBTA. Subways and buses, 1.3 million people per day take the take, take T uh, uh, assets uh, to work. Um, I'll, get, I'll give you some more on financial facts in a moment. Then we have the RMV, which is our basically our, our collection mechanism. We collect over a billion dollars in fees, both RMV fees and other fees, every year. It costs us around $72 million. The reason I hesitate is I just found out that it's more than 68 uh, today. But 
if you figure that that is the cost of collection of over a billion dollars, that's actually pretty cheap. But we have 50, we have 30, uh, we have 30 RMV facilities. And everybody wants an RMV facility in their neighborhood, is that right? And when they close, there is a price to pay. Uh, the non-operating division, that would be me, and all my colleagues in fiscal, isn't it wonderful to call yourself overhead? Um, uh, but it's HR, it's planning, it's uh, civil rights, it's, um, it's audit, it, it's the non-operating divisions. If you, can, if you look at highway aeronautics, rail and transit, MBTA and RMV, that's our line. The overhead, such as myself, we're the staff. If there's anything else on here. Yeah, we collect one billion. Just want to make sure you know. So next time you go in to get your license renewed, at a very cheap price. Just remember why you're there. Um, I said before, let's go to the fun financial facts. I don't know how fun they are, but they're financial facts. The cost of commuter rail locomotive is around 5.1 million. The average age of an existing commuter rail locomotive is 22 years. The useful life is about 20, 21 years. We need to replace 40 plus of those. Highway miles maintain 11,500. You see the number of state-owned bridges. I don't know if any of you are aware of the accelerated bridge <coughs> program that we put into place uh, four years ago. We've done a lot of small bridges. We brought what we call the structurally deficient bridge index uh, to a manageable level. It should be around 5%, but we stemmed the tide of it going into the 30s and 40s. It's now down, I believe, around 15 to 20%. We want to bring it down to 5%. This is not interesting stuff. It's simply making sure that the bridges that you use every day are safe and that you don't start seeing big X's through them. And there are some bridges in the Commonwealth that have big X's on them that are not being that are not used because number one, we don't have the money to pay for them, to pay for their repair. And number two, because we don't have the money to pay for their repair. <laughs> Talked about the guy who runs a snow file. Gets paid. With fringe, it's around $56,000, and we have at least 1,000 maintenance equipment operators. Um, getting back to bridges just for a moment. Uh, I'm not sure what the year was. I'm going to say it was six years ago, but if anybody remembers the I-35 disaster in Minneapolis, uh, when that happened, and there were several people who got killed, it was a wake-up call for every DOT in the country to make sure that that does not happen. And that's why we put in the Accelerated Bridge Program. But the Accelerated Bridge Program still doesn't come close to fixing all the bridges that are structurally deficient. Structurally deficient, by the way, it's not, you can't, you shouldn't drive on them. You, should, you can drive on them and you'll be fine. But you want to keep that index as low as possible. No more than 5%. It's like uh, the unemployment rate. Ideal unemployment allegedly is 5% because those are the people who just are never going to be looking for a job. They don't want to look for a job. We have our problems when unemployment is 8 or 9%. Uh, but structurally deficient bridge index, you want to keep it at 5%. You'll never get it down to 100 because as you fix one, another one's going to come, uh, going to go onto the list. I talked earlier about the number of uh, RMV branches. Um, we have we have, we have 30 branches, yeah, we have 30 branches, down from 35 in 2008. The average RMV employee with fringe and benefits makes around $45,000. But the most interesting part of that about it is that you can see that our internet transactions now are just about equal to our branch visits. And what we're trying to do is bring down the wait time of the branch visits. We don't want you to go in and wait 20 minutes to see one. We should wait 10 minutes maybe. And we're having success at that, but it's not easy. But we want to drive as many people to the internet as possible, but always understanding that there's a, divi a, a digital divide out there, and you're never going to be able to get away from the physical branches. Back to the aeronautics division, I found it amazing. They maintain the safety and standards of 39 airports, and we have 10 people in the division. They're very busy people. The three expansion projects I talked about, just so you have an idea of what we're looking at, 3.85 billion. 
from South Coast Rail, South Station expansion to the Green Line extension. Keeping in mind that on South Station, we don't know how much money we can get if we have an overbuild there from the private side. If we have someone build an office building above South Street Station, as, South Station as it exists now, and how it will exist. And if we have someone who develops a commercial office, office tower above that, and that pays mass thought a huge amount of rent. Maybe it doesn't cost us 850 million. Maybe it costs us a lot less. But we have to expand South, <coughs> South Station. The commuter rails are packed. Whether you're talking about the Franklin Line, the Worcester Line, um, Fitchburg Line, they are packed in the morning. I know that for a fact. I take the Worcester one, Worcester, Worcester Line every day. But fortunately, it starts in Worcester, so I was going to see. <laughs> The T, T capacity issues, there was a study that came out recently, I want to say in November, from Urban Land Institute, which I think does very good work. And they said, watch out T, because Boston is one of the few cities that's growing, that your capacity is going to be strained. That was borne out by ridership which even in July, after the fare hikes of roughly 21%, ridership went up. Ridership continues to go up. We still charge less for the T than most other major metropolitan transit systems. New York is 235. Chicago, where I lived for many years, I think is 235 now, is 225 left. We just went for $2. Uh, and it was not, everybody remembers, it was not an easy thing to do and not a fun thing to do, and no one wants to do it anymore. And last, the total number of MassDOT employees, 10,000 plus, not much over 10,000. But again, this should drive home the fact that transportation infrastructure is, number one, expensive. It depreciates on a physical basis every day. When I drive my car on the highway, I'm damaging it. The truck is damaging it, imperceptibly. But the concept of depreciation as an accounting concept is one thing, as a physical phenomenon is something else. But infrastructure is critical to our economy, it's critical to every economy, and it must be maintained. Anybody know where this is? Someone take a guess? Go ahead. Fall River. I'm oh, sorry? Actually, that's Fall River. Chicago Skyway. Um, it's a transaction. It was a, it was a public-private partnership. Well, it's, it's significant. It, it, it's a toll road that the city of Chicago built back in, I want to say, 1956 for the purpose of transporting workers from Chicago, downtown Chicago, to um, the Gary Steel Mills. Um, it was financed with bonds that were issued by the city of Chicago, the city of Chicago asset. Uh, in the mid-80s, it went bankrupt, and it defaulted on its bonds. Not a good thing for the bondholders, not a good thing for anybody. Um, but eventually it came back. The city made a decision in, let's say, 1996, 1997, that the Skyway had to be fixed up. It had to be essentially rebuilt, and it was. In around 2002, an idea came to the city of Chicago that maybe the city should consider, to, uh, consider, consider leasing the Chicago Skyway. Eventually, the city did. And in February 2005, a private entity, Macquarie out of Australia, and Sintra out of Spain, which runs the largest toll road operator in the world, paid the city of Chicago $1.8 billion, $1.83 billion, for the right to use the Skyway, to operate the Skyway for the next 99 years, um, thereby relieving the city of Chicago of any responsibility of running that facility. Um, there's still $500 million left out of the proceeds. A lot of the other proceeds were used to uh, pay down debt, pay down the debt of the Skyway, which at the time was around $450 million. Uh, Mayor Daley, at the time, um, also wanted to make sure that there was a benefit to the people of Chicago, and so he did something that was antithetical to municipal finance, which was use the proceeds from the sale or lease of a capital asset for your operating budget. Uh, but you don't say no to Mayor Daley. 
And so we took $100 million, roughly 5% of the deal. They said we're going to plow $100 million into 20 uh, social services programs for five years, $1 million each. Uh, Meals on Wheels, ex-offender programs, things like that. Um, frankly, a brilliant thing to do. I think he would have gotten the alderman to vote 100% for the deal because they're looking at $1.8 billion. But when they saw that $100 million was going toward uh, programs that they would like to see funded, uh, they were even more enthusiastic. But this is the first privatization of a of an a, of a toll road toll road asset in North America ever. The only one prior to that being Highway 407 in Toronto. Okay, but you know why these are significant? Lower left. Luis Munoz Airport in Puerto Rico just did a 75-year lease. The government has leased it for 75 years. I can't quite remember who it's to, but it was for just around $2 billion. By the way, getting back to the Skyway for, for a moment, there's no financial obligation on the part of the city of Chicago to maintain, maintain any aspect of the Skyway. It is entirely the obligation of the lessor. And at the end of 99 years, the lessor has to Let's see, has to return it to the city of Chicago in the exact same condition as when it was leased in 2005. And it was leased in pristine condition. If that means that the lessee has to rebuild that asset three times, it's at that person's responsibility and not at the city of Chicago's. Just want to point that out. Um, Indiana Toll Road. In June of 2006, Governor Mitch Daniels saw what Chicago had done with the Skyway. He leased the Indiana Toll Road, which is I-80 going across the top part of the state, around 80 miles, uh, for $3.8 billion. Took the proceeds of $3.8 billion, put it in the bank. They had a little bit of an advertising campaign. They said, we're making $5,000 a minute. The interest rates were a little bit higher than they are now. Uh, on this money. And we are plowing it back into transportation assets all over the state. And if you Google Indiana Toll Road, Governor Mitch Daniels, transportation, you'll see exactly how much they are spending, which is money that they can't get from the federal government because the federal government doesn't have it to fix transportation assets. Anybody recognize this one? Just came into the news a couple of days ago. Midway Airport, uh, downtown Chicago. Deal failed in, in 2008 because the buyer couldn't come up with a whole purchase price. Ended up letting Chicago have $126 million of earnest money because they couldn't close. Chicago shed a tear. But the deal, this, this, the deal took place, it was late 2007, closed in 2008, they couldn't close. This was Citibank infrastructure uh, investors, by the way. Uh, big infrastructure fund. Uh, a lot of state and local pension money that's invested with uh, uh, Citibank. Um, they couldn't buy it. Um, the deal recently has come to the fore. Mayor Emanuel has resurrected the deal. If it works along the same lines as was talked about in 2008, it will generate roughly $1.3 billion for the city of Chicago that it has committed to use for infrastructure and or shoring up pension funds which are woefully underfunded. Um, Millennium Garages. $563 million back in 2009, December 17th, around 12.35, I believe, p.m. when it closed. I did the deal. Um, and for the first time in the city's history, the park district has a capital budget. Paid off all the debt, and parks throughout the city of Chicago, the city of Chicago have a capital budget for upgrading playground equipment, making sure it's ADA accessible, and all those good things that need to be done. We've never had a budget before. <coughs> Pennsylvania Turnpike, the grand, the mother of all deals, didn't take place. 2008, financial crisis, um, didn't take place because there wasn't a buyer. This is around June before, before the, the big stuff happened, the big bad stuff happened in September. Um, but the consortium between Abertus out of Spain and I believe it was out of City of Goldman Sachs, I'm not sure which. Um, won the bid, $12.8 billion. The, the Turnpike Authority turned the deal down. They said, we do not want to sell. 
if they turned around today and tried to, tried to get that privatization take place and try to get that money, they may get $6 billion, maybe. <coughs> they had $12 billion that Governor Rendell was going to use for transportation assets throughout the state of Pennsylvania, but the deal failed. And I don't think that would ever continue. Fort McMurray Public Schools. I talked about how you can generate money by leasing assets. And again, you're generating money for the idea of paying for other infrastructure assets under a public-private partnership. Fort McMurray Private Schools is in Alberta. And in Alberta, they've come up with, a, they have come up with it, but they avail themselves of a scheme, that scheme in the English good sense, of availability payments. They needed 25 schools to be built or repaired. What they did is they went out there to the market and said, we want to offer a long-term design, build, finance, maintain, operate contract for corporate entities in the business of building, maintaining, financing, and operating schools. <coughs> the beauty behind availability payments is that as long as the school is available, the school district, the government, still pays for that school, maybe not in terms of a municipal bond, but in terms of paying the operator of that school. So you're swapping uh, availability, availability, availability payments for, instead of debt service. Still a, a hard obligation, just like debt service. But what you've got is an entity that's on the hook in case the roof leaks, either on the day that the certificate, certificate of occupancy is granted, or six <coughs> years later, or 25 years later. And there is class, there are classrooms or a gym that's unavailable. Guess what? Your availability payment goes down. You don't have to pay as much as you paid yesterday, last month, until that is fixed. And it's the responsibility of the equity to fix it. It's a very good system. And it's being done all over Canada, all over Europe, Western Europe, Spain, France, the UK. Uh, we have not done it here in the US. One thing I think that you need to think about, though, is when it comes to these deals, and there are, there are quite a few more that I haven't put up there. I just put up what I thought was with the significant ones. Is that I would advise you to stay away from, oh, I, I want to talk about Chicago parking meters. Not quite as good as all the rest of them. Uh, although there are some things that were good about it. When it comes to these deals, and they generate money. I told folks that they should not judge them monolithically. They shouldn't say, that was a good deal, or that was a bad deal. You have to deconstruct the deal into three categories. Number one, valuation. Did the lessor get paid the right amount by the lessee? Was it high enough? And did it represent value for the lessor who's getting the money in? I think in the case of the Chicago Skyway at 1.83 billion, where the next highest bid was 800 million, I think valuation was probably pretty good. You have to look at the transition, the transition from its operation by the public to the operation by the private. How smooth is that transition? In virtually all these deals, the transition was seamless. The user never noticed anything from the point at which the asset was transferred from the public entity to the private entity. And last, what are you using the proceeds for? Are you using them for capital? Are you making a capital for capital exchange? Or are you using them to plug an operating budget? If you're using to plug an operating budget, that grade is going to be a D or an F. If you're using it for capital, the grade is going to be an A. So each one of these deals gets three grades. For deals that happen, the Chicago garage is 9,163 parking spaces, 563 million. Someone can check my math, but I'm pretty sure that's around $1,000 per space. For 75 years that uh, Chicago got in, the parkers didn't notice anything other than the price going up. Um, now that's, I know that, okay, I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, however, the 
use of proceeds, again, to establish capital budgets for city parks throughout the city was a good thing. Let's get back to the raising of the prices. When that deal came about, I was at a breakfast. It had somehow gotten into the papers that we were thinking about, yes, I'll use the word privatizing, uh, Midway Airport um, and the uh, downtown parking garages that the city owned. And there was a guy sitting across from me and he said, why are you privatizing um, Millennium Park Garage? I love Millennium Park Garage. He said, tell me, why do you love Millennium Park Garage? I drive in from the suburbs every day. This garage is the closest one to the office. There are always spaces that are available. And it's the cheapest garage in the neighborhood. I said, thank you very much. You just gave me every single reason why this is exactly what we should be doing. <laughs> Keeping in mind that the city of Chicago was responsible for operating that garage. In fact, it came under my purview. I don't have a clue as to how to operate a garage. I, have to, you know, I know how to count the money that comes in, but I don't know how to operate it. I remember my mother and brother were visiting me uh, in the summer of 2000 and 2005, and we were driving from our house in downtown Chicago, driving south on Lakeshore Drive to go to a concert at Millennium Park. And we're driving down Lakeshore Drive, we're getting closer to the park, I can see a lot of people streaming in, we should be among them. I'm looking for the garage. There is no sign for the garage. And I'm getting very frustrated. Of course, my brother in the back seat says, well, this is a big time CFO. I can't find the garage. Oh. <laughs> it was a lovely time. <laughs> In any case, Chicago parking meters, terrible transition, bad use of proceeds. Um, valuation was pretty good. 1.2 billion for 35,000 meters, you do the math. Not bad. But, but not a good deal and put a crimp in the business of leasing for at least three or four years. The most recent deal, and it was the first deal, was Ohio State University, which recent, recently uh, monetized 39,000 spaces, 500-odd million dollars, or 400-odd million dollars. Anybody know why this is significant? First of all, can you identify it? Okay, I know there's a three there, and it's Route 3. <coughs> it's Route 3 in Weymouth. We got a proposal in, sort of, because they didn't leave us with any papers, by a private entity which said to us, if you allow us to do the following, you will have a widened road. And I understand that Route 3, I don't live in that neighborhood, but I understand that Route 3, Route 3 is jam-packed in the morning and the evening. It's mainly a two-lane highway right here. It's one of ours. That what happens is that what, they, what the proposal was, that we will widen the road so the current capacity can flow through more easily. We will put in the middle a single lane that in the morning goes west and the evening goes east. Always 65, all 55 miles an hour, whatever mile an hour it, it's supposed to. It's a managed lane. But it will cost. It will cost the driver to go into that managed lane. He can still take the two-hour lanes, the four-hour lanes, but if he wants to get home to that baseball game more quickly because it happens to be his son playing in, on the team, he can either drive for free, it's going to take him the same amount of time, maybe a little shorter, or he can go in that 65 mile an hour lane for $6 and get there faster. We are a service is being supplied, but not by the government. But we have a dilemma here. Because the question is, okay, to the private entity, and by the way, this is not on our big list of things that we have to do. So this doesn't even rise to the occasion of the $13 billion plan. But what, what this does, it supplies a service at a price. And my question to the private side was, how much are you going to make on this? I want to know. We're not going to do it unless you give me an idea. They say, well, like every other private equity uh, company, in, which invests in infrastructure, we're looking for somewhere between 8 to 12 percent, call it 10 percent for round numbers. Should we allow someone out there to make that, or should we do it ourselves? If we do it ourselves, we're paying for it, and it doesn't work, we've taken undue risk. On the other hand, if it does work, we won't make 10 to 12 percent because we're not going to charge 
as much as the private entity would, how much would we make? Our cost of capital in the Commonwealth is roughly four and a quarter percent. So if we can make something above four and a quarter, a quarter percent, we should be happy. If it costs us four and a quarter percent to issue bonds, and we can make something above that, we should be happy. But this will be an interesting situation. We're trying to make sure that we understand it and that we are doing the right thing by allowing this investment to take place. Let's talk about some of the brutal facts, getting back to MassCon. We run a zero-based operating budget. And we have roughly around $800 million in annual revenues. That's tolls, uh, money that comes in as what we call contract assistance, which is basically grants from the state that take place uh, by statute. Uh, but we take in roughly $800 million, and we're supposed to spend $800 million. We don't always spend it, because sometimes we can't spend it on the toll roads, because we don't have enough people, but we're trying to hire. Let's assume that we have, we spend all $800 million. Take in $800 million, we spend $800 million. Everybody's fine. Be careful. Look at our capital budget. In FY12, fiscal year 12, we capitalized $224 million in expenses. So in other words, we took rents, salaries, utility payments, all sorts of stuff that you normally, if you were a household, pay out of your, uh, out of your, out of your salary, your operating budget. Instead, we charge them to the MasterCard. And we charge them at roughly four and a quarter percent, which is the weighted average cost of capital. So we didn't pay 224 million in salaries. We will end up paying somewhere over 398 million in salaries salaries, rents. Basically 1.78 times. Certainly, if you were going to finance hard assets, you go out and finance your car, that's going to give you your return. It's going to get you to work. You finance asphalt, you finance a guardrail, you finance subway trains. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, that's the right way to pay for assets because they have long lives. But paying for someone's salary on the credit card is wrong because that, that $398 million is eventually going to make its way into a bond that is the obligation of the state. And oh, by the way, we have among the highest level of indebtedness of many states. Not that we can't afford it. We happen to be a wealthy state. We, gener we, we, we generate a ton of money in the state, but we happen to have a high level per capita of bonded debt in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The irony is we're actually looking to increase that, but we think that we're doing the right thing. In any case, that gives you a little bit of background, and I underscored the obvious. We have massive capital needs. I'll talk about primarily about the highways. The brutal facts of the T. The T must run a balanced budget. It's hard to tell. In FY13, revenues are expected to be $1.8 billion. Not bad. Pretty big number. We serve 1.3 million people per day. And as per the ULI study, the ridership is growing, which means with the current capacity that we have, trains will be later. You'll be waiting longer. Um, it'll be more crowded. This is not solvable unless you start throwing money at the system in a way that we should, that's a way that's responsible. The T's required debt service on the big, big debt is 120 million. It happens to grow exponentially over the next five years, the way it was structured. Whether you think that was right or wrong, when you can't possibly think it was right, it is a fact. And we can't repudiate debt. It's not what we do. It's not what anybody does. If you take the debt on, you got to pay. But what we're trying to do is give the team money so it can pay that debt. Because otherwise, it's a break-even operation, which is pretty impressive. For the oldest operation in the country, the T is actually break-even. You look like you're done, and I'll prove it to you. In any case, mass thought, uh, the T, I should have put T. I did. T has massive capital needs. So what do you do? You can issue municipal bonds, and we're going to. I don't know if we'll do all 13 billion in municipal bonds, but we might. We can layer into the mix the leasing of existing, which we call, which are brownfield. That has nothing to do with environmental impact or Brownfield is a definition in the infrastructure business of existing assets. We could transfer the risk of operating new assets, new being greenfield assets, under the availability payment scheme. 
But in any case, Massachusetts, the Commonwealth, the Mass DOT, uh, the Governor and Secretary Davey, along with his staff, just today we were discussing a bond bill which is going to be roughly $16 billion in indebtedness. But if we are careful, we take our lessons from the big dig, and Secretary Davey is fond of saying this is the anti-big dig capital budget. Because we know how much things cost, we have controls, we are much better at putting assets on the books and in operation than we ever were before. Look at Accelerated Bridge Program, which has been hailed nationwide as a model across the country for bridge repair, and it's not inconsiderable at $3 billion. We are putting forth the Accelerated Transportation Plan, which you're welcome to take uh, a copy of. We only have four, but it's on our website. It is backed up by this front page of a model, which again is on our website. The front page of the model, which looks at all transportation assets throughout the Commonwealth, how they operate on an annual basis, down to how much we pay the motorman, how much we pay the toll booth operator, what will happen if we go all electronic polling, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's backed up by roughly 75 worksheets. Um, if we had built a model like that way back when I was first starting out, starting out in banking, I'd hit the recalculate button, I'd come back the next day and maybe it was done. This day and age takes a second so you find out how much stuff costs. But don't think for a second that there is not the desire to finance our operations correctly. We were talking about um, uh, capitalizing expenses. Giving money to the T because it needs it to cover the cost of the big, big debt. And then there's a 13 plus billion accelerated transportation plan, which speaks to 75% of that money going to the state of good repair, which we think is incredibly important. 25% of that money going to expansion projects, the three largest of which are South Coast Rail, the Green Line extension, which, oh, by the way, we have to do as a matter of law, and South Station expansion. South Station expansion, so we have more commuter rail, because that's what the people want. We went out to 19 communities through December 19th, starting in October. And we have, again, this is all documented. You can see what everybody's saying. We want more buses. And we want more buses in this particular area because we need to go to our jobs. Hospitals want more buses. You saw what happened during the blizzard. Um, and not that there's anything we can do about that, but on the other hand, we've got to have, that. We, we have, the average bus is around 12 years old. That's their life. No different from the locomotive or the, or, 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 or the train car. Uh, but we were told by the people that they want more assets put online by mass DOT. That's fine, but don't think for a second that it isn't going to cost. So we're hopeful that the spending program, which I've described as 13 plus billion, is pretty clear what we want to do. Um, the revenue package, frankly, is critical. And there you may have heard that the governor's plan is to increase income taxes by a percent, drop the sales tax by percent, I think, it got more, and have the sales tax, all the money that goes into the sales tax, go into an infrastructure fund. And that infrastructure fund will be there to fund transportation. We're very much in favor of that, especially given the progressive nature of the sales tax. In every way we stress test it, we see more money coming in for infrastructure, because that's what we need. So that's the story about Commonwealth Massachusetts. I hope I've made it clear. I apologize if I was a little bit disjointed in terms of how it was laid out for you. If you have any questions, Steve, how, how do you want to do this? Yeah, yes. Um, again, thank you very much. I okay. appreciate it. Okay. We have about a half hour for uh, question and answer. And I just, I'd like to lay down some ground rules at the beginning. Um, it is a question and answer session, so I encourage everyone to ask an actual question and uh, to keep it brief so we can hear from uh, as many people as possible. And I guess with that, um, if, is there a student with a question? We can start. Yes. Uh, in, when you were talking about the uh, Route 3, uh, and, and you said that the public sector could, could create this, this middle lane and toll it, but you wouldn't be able to do 8 to 12%. 
Uh, I'm wondering, is that simply because of political constraints, or is there another reason why, in theory, you, you could not do that yourself? No, we could do H12%. We would choose not to. You would choose not to. Why? We would choose, um, because we think that uh, when we build assets, we're not building them to make money. We're building them for the service that they supply. Um, if we did, we're able to charge 8 to 12%. Um, because, say, for instance, that you've done your market research, you find out that this project is universally liked by all the potential drivers. And that potential driver is willing to pay $6. And that $6 equates to 10% return. Um, we might think about it, but the question is, what do we do with that return? And what we should do, and what we would do if we did it, we would, we would plow that back into other transportation infrastructure. But we're getting a little far afield of what we're good at. We're not good at making money. We're good at running certain assets. Uh, managed lanes, we've never done. It's been done by other people across the country on the <coughs> private side. Um, there's a very good article, by the way. Um, Wall Street Journal today. Of course, I read Wall Street. Um, but if you take one and pass it, it talks about the Dulles Greenway. Just opened up a couple of months ago. And it's a managed lane. The cynics call it a Lexus lane, done by the private side. Incredibly successful. Google it, you'll find out that there are no critics, or very few. But um, it's a good question. I think that. The bigger, the bigger question is, what is the risk that we are taking? Because if we are shifting the risk to the private side, we bear none of the risk if no one decide, if their market research is, done, is wrong and they don't get the ridership. Then they're not making money, they'll lose money. The Indiana toll road is losing money for the buyers back in 2006. Chicago Skyway is not making anywhere nearly as much money. So this is the risk that the private sector takes. We don't want to take that kind of risk. Well, I'd like to know why the state keeps blaming the big dig for the T's debt problems. Because when the state was building the big dig, it ran out of ways to pay for it. It just took, for, turned it over to the turn park. Turn park borrowed $2 billion. And then, of course, they were merged. So this seems to me to be the state's and the, and the DOT's debt and taxpayers' debt, not necessarily the T's. The T's had long money problems going back years and years, capital problems. The revenues have never come close to paying for the operation. So I, I just don't understand why it's all put on the big dig, unless that's just an easy way to something. Easy um, to the, there, there were transit commitments that, that were made by the big dig, that the, by, the, by, by the transit, by, by the T, that the T had to finance. So it's, it was, and there were transit commitments that were made because of the big dig. So there are things that the T agreed to do and to finance because of the big dig. So it's more related than you might think. Um, and it happens to result in roughly $120 million per year, $140 million per year of debt service that the T is, um, that the T is, is obligated to pay. First of all, we're not gonna repudiate debt. Could you transfer it over to the state? Yeah, that's a possibility. But what the plan that we're looking at essentially does that because the state, we want the state to come up with more money to give to the T to cover the debt that needs to be paid, whether it's by the T or whatever entity happens to be uh, the issuer, in fact. So it's not, uh, there were transit commitments and we can identify every single one of them. The T did issue debt for those transit commitments that were made as part of the agreement to do the big deal. So it's, it's, it's Murky, but not 100%. Good. This gentleman, this, yeah, this, this is a follow-up to the same question. Mm -hmm. uh, every time I try to look at any transportation budget, I have great difficulty because we've got a tradition in this country of governments operating on a cash flow basis instead of using standard accounting and having a balance sheet, a cash flow statement, and an operating statement. And like when I think about uh, being a buyer, of the T in a um, you know one of these you know, privatization activities, I'm 
very interested in whether or not the operating system would show a profit on an annual basis if we correctly accounted for uh, the capital assets, the balance sheet. You know, I would assume right now, since the assets are over fully depreciated, uh, if we were using correct commercial accounting, then we'd be running a profit on the annual operating statement, but a huge negative cash flow, since we have to finance the problems created by an aging infrastructure. But because the government won't use normal, you know, accounting any business would use, the stuff is opaque. It's confused by political history. Uh, to fix the big dig, they took this money from here and stuck it in there and this got merged with that. Mm -hmm. So if I were coming in as chief operating officer of the thing, the first thing I would do is clean up the debris in the accounting and be able to look at a P&L for the operation of real operations. And the T is natural. To the best of my knowledge, the T has got a monopoly on a valuable service with a lot of infrastructure and the only funnies in the pricing and the operations are the bus routes that are kept for political reasons and the fare structure. But other than that, you've got a real business. Um, so why don't you use uh, normal accounting? Uh, I'd be glad to show you our latest financials. We're going to go to the Finance and Audit Committee of the Board next mm -hmm. week and show the first, uh, first half. And I do believe that we, and, and, and based on my experience in accounting for with financial statements, we now, I don't know how it was done in the past, but we are using standard accounting methodologies. We do have an income statement, statement of expense, of revenues and expenses. It is extremely clear. Um, I would also tell you that in terms of the business that we operate, it will never be privatized. The reason why it will never be privatized is because it can never make money. The capital costs are too high. Unless you're talking about free capital, which no one has access to, unless you're the federal government, uh, that uh, they are that the business is not a good business. It supplies a service. It charges among the lowest rates in the country for a major uh, transit authority. Um, and I would challenge virtually everything that you've said in terms of the business being fundamentally sound. It is not fundamentally sound. That's the problem. But it also avoids the problem of privatization. There's no private entity that will ever buy an organization that is either break even or lose money unless they can somehow cut costs and raise fares. And we know how difficult that is. So I'm not sure that I agree with you. But I'm glad to go over the counter statements if you want to see it. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was wondering a little bit about the uh, what you're saying regarding uh, trans you know, long-term leases to the private sector being a way of transferring risk. Uh, I guess my question is, on some level, isn't the public sector still bearing the risk? Like, if it, you know, the, the tolls don't end up being able to cover the repairs needed to keep that bridge uh, in the right condition, and you know, the private sector can't make profit and they get out and they go bankrupt or whatever, then in some ways the public sector still has the risk, right? So I was just curious a little bit about the transferring of risk and does the public sector still really retain a certain portion of that risk in, in a way? The private sector, such as the Chicago uh, Skyway Lease, uh, Centra and McCrory, uh, they bear the responsibility of maintaining uh, the Skyway, the bridge, to the standard that the city of Chicago maintained it, if not higher. Um, the lease concession agreement, which is this thick, uh, gets to the point where it says, if it snows one inch at this particular point on the Skyway, you have to, the, the private sector has to have a plow on the, on the skyway. If roadkill is there for more than two hours, it is an event of default. And in an event of default, if they don't have the snow plow out there, if they haven't cleared the roadkill, I mean, these are two extreme examples, the skyway will get turned back to the city of Chicago at no expense to the city of Chicago. If that hadn't been written in there, then I suspect that the amount that the lessee would have paid would have been much higher. For the same reason that the city of Chicago said you can only raise tolls 50, 50 cents every two years. And after that, they go up by inflation. They should be going up by inflation to cover the cost of maintaining the road. But the city of Chicago said we will protect the drivers to make sure that they aren't gouged. If they hadn't put that in there, it wouldn't have been 1.83 billion, it would have been 2.83 billion. So was the risk for absolutely every circumstance covered? No, you don't know. Certainly over the course of 99 years. 
And if, oh, by the way, the, um, uh, the, the, the private entity were to go bankrupt, the, the, the asset gets turned back. Again, that's the risk of the private side. They're the ones who are saying, we think that we can make a go out of this. And so far, it's been mildly successful. But the road has been maintained beautifully. I took it on the way up from Illinois to uh, Massachusetts when I, when I moved here. I got a ticket on it. <laughs> So fine, say it, fine, you know, see you later, Dick. I'd like to know um, why the governor's current um, infrastructure plan didn't include P3 components. It does include P3 components. It, uh, we have a P3 commission that is about to be convened. Right. Uh, that will act in an advisory commission, uh, advisory um, uh, capacity. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what you'd want in terms, I mean, there is, there is, in our enabling legislation from 2009, there is public-private partnership language. It speaks to the commission that we have to have in place, on getting around to put it in place. But you put that in place, you have the folks who are coming at us on Route 3, you vet it through this commission, and the commission recommends to MassDOT whether to do it or not to do it. We can't walk into the infrastructure plan and say, we're going to do a P3 on this and P3 on that. We don't know if we're going to. We have the ability to do it. And now what we have is, and we have also started state infrastructure bank. We're essentially raising our hand for the, for, the, for the idea of private capital. Come on into Massachusetts. If you can do something for us at a reasonable return for yourself, we're glad to consider it. But beyond that, I'm not sure exactly what else we could have done to encourage P3 as part of the legislation. Can I follow up? So the $13 billion bond authorization, does that, include, does that include reductions for potential future P3 projects, or might you not use the full authorization because of potential? Again, it's only authorization. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Someone came in and said, we have, a private, we have a PPP methodology for this particular project that you want to do, and we liked it. Yeah, we, wouldn't, we, we would reduce the authorization, the actual amount that we borrow by that amount. So no, it's it's there. We are very. We want there to be private capital coming into the state. We just want it to be fair and equitable, and we want there to be absolutely. No, we want it to be seamless for the users. And you think the 2009 legislation is enough for for implementing P3? Yeah, pretty much. Well, I think the 2009 is enough, as long as you have this P3 commission, as long as you are getting attention from the private sector, because right now the private sector doesn't care about Massachusetts. They don't think that there's anything to do here. So they ignore us. They go to Virginia. They go to Florida. You go down to southern Florida. It's all privatizations. And the road system is magnificent. 595, 295. These are great roads in and around the Fort Lauderdale and Miami areas. They're privatized. 75, 95% of the roads, of the toll roads in France are privatized. I'm not advocating, again, for the cameras. We are not advocating wholesale privatizations. We're just saying that as a way to finance part of the 13 billion, as opposed to issuing debt, which we're all going to end up paying for, if the private side can do it, why not at least consider it? That's what we're. Uh, that's all we're saying. Yeah, you. Uh, sorry, you asked a question. You responded to a question on the two finances, and it, it uh, made me remember the 1999 deal on the legislature to basically turn over a significant fraction of the state income tax, uh, sales tax. Excuse me to the team, which was supposed to solve the problem. Of course, we know what happened following that. It was a dot-com plus, you know, state sales tax revenues dipped, and we saw a similar debt dip in 2007, 2008. So how does the current plan deal with that situation? That, that these kinds of cycles in the sales tax are going to be pretty difficult. Right. Well, keep in mind that the amount that was going to infrastructure from the sales tax was a portion of the sales tax. There's a big difference between a portion of the sales tax and how much that generates, as opposed to the entire sales tax. So what we're looking at here is a plan that says we take the entire sales tax, lower the rate by a percent, and put all that money that we think will accumulate in almost any economic cycle. Granted, we can't be 100% sure because we certainly were proven wrong in 2008 and in the early part of the uh, 2000s when you had the dot-com bust. But there is a, uh, there, the thought process has not been one that has been, it's been a rigorous thought process based on our calculations, how much money will go in based on an economic downturn of different severities. And we put in 
And as long as we're putting in the, I, we think that there's going to be excess money based on infrastructure needs, although that's kind of far-fetched, given what the size of our infrastructure needs if we're going to do everything. But based on the 13 billion plan, we think that the plan does work based on the fact that it's the entire sales tax that goes into the infrastructure fund and not just a penny or two pennies of the sales tax. That's what the critical difference is. Quick follow-up. Um, any consideration of a stabilization fund arrangement? Because whether it's the, the whole sales tax or, or one penny out of five, which was what the original deal was, about 20% or so, um, the, the fact is you're going to have cycles. You're going to have years in which you over-collect, you're going to have years in which you under-collect. You know, my sense from the past history is if we over-collect, we'll never see the money again. Um, so is, is, there, is there a stabilization? There's not a stabilization uh, aspect to it. Not that I know of, I may be wrong, uh, but I can look into it, but I'm pretty sure that that is not part of the deal. There's, you know, the state runs a rainy day fund, uh, which is, I'm not saying that that is the stabilization fund for transportation, it's not, uh, but I don't know that that same type of plan is being contemplated. In the blue coat. Yeah. For the privatization deals that you were talking about, what is the what is the liquidity discount? In other words, how far does the DCF model valuation diverge from the actual cash value of the deals that you're familiar with? Not 100% sure I answer your questions. So, but you're, 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 what you're asking is how does the valuation take place? That so I'm assuming you, you plug into a discounted cash flow model to get more valuation. As a particular methodology for evaluation, yes. Right. right. So how, does, how far does what the theoretical model is telling you the value of the asset is differ from the actual cash value that the private sector comes to you? That all depends on the discount rate. And do you have like a ballpark range as to what it usually is? Um, it's in and around our weighted average cost of capital. And so you look at the four, four and a quarter percent. Right now, or uh, two months ago, when a few of us were advocating to load up the boat on some debt up there that was available, the Commonwealth could borrow roughly 30-year debt at two and three quarters percent. Um, we didn't. Now it's around three percent, and it continues to go up. Although not precipitously, it has gone up precipitously. Where it stops, it's hard to say. But we think that the average cost of capital for the Commonwealth going forward has been and will be roughly around four, four and a quarter percent. Um, the cash flow models of the assets that we're talking about, depending upon whether you use our cost of capital of four and a quarter percent or the cost of capital of the private side, which is going to be considerably higher, the question is what is that what what is the PV that's spit out? It all depends on what the private side is using as its cost of capital, which most likely they can't borrow at the same rate that we can. But if they can borrow at a rate that is going to give them a reasonable return on their equity, keeping in mind, keeping in mind that, um, that they're there to, you know, to make a profit, and it's a return on equity, and the amount of equity they put in tends to be relatively small, they can do that by virtue of financing that asset with a fair amount of debt. We finance it entirely with debt. So there's a fundamental fundamental difference as to the way the private side finances versus the way finance. We, we finance. We're simply looking, how do we get money in? In the city of Chicago, it took in $1.83 billion. Indiana took in $3.8 billion. Again, using it, as long as you're using it for transportation purposes, that's a pretty good deal. If, the way, if, if your cost of capital is extraordinarily low, I'd rather take it in, have it accumulate a little bit of interest, and use it as opposed to going into the market. It's, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, yeah, I, my fundamental you know, hurdle in understanding this whole idea has always been if, you know, if something can, can make money, then the private sector is interested in doing it. If it can't make money, they're not interested in doing it. Correct. So why can't the public sector just do that and make the money? Is the only difference that the private sector is willing to charge higher prices for the tolls? Um, partially. Um, they have advantage in terms of procurement. They aren't subject to all the procurement rules that states tend to be subject to. When the city of Chicago uh, was the owner and operator of the garages below Millennium Park, there was a manager of the garages. 
he was operating at roughly 72, 73 percent of capacity. I couldn't fire him. On the other hand, I couldn't find, if I found someone who, was, who would run them at 99 percent of capacity, I'm not going to pay him a bonus. We don't do that. You're talking about core competencies of things we do well and things we don't do well. You can also talk about what markets are out there. The Midway Airport, Chicago has a fabulous Department of Aeronautics, just like we have a great mass port. We run a very good airport here. Chicago runs very good airports there. But someone's willing to pay in 2.525 billion for that airport. Mayor Emanuel has no place to turn to for capital, for infrastructure. He has no capacity to issue any debt. And he has a deal that's looking at him in the face that says, here's $1.3 billion. Use it for infrastructure to fix up viaducts, to fix up roads throughout the city of Chicago. That's an irresistible notion. And will, the, will they make money at, a, at, at, at Midway Airport? I'm sure they will. Maybe not as much as they're saying they will. We've seen that happen in Indiana. They're not making as much money as they thought they would. But that's the risk that the private side is willing to take. It's not the risk that a public entity should take. So in every, every circumstance is different. I hope that, that explains it. So the public sector is still essentially you know, giving up a certain amount of opportunity in, in exchange for having less risk, in exchange for? Sure. Okay. So let's well, so, so look, look at the Chicago parking meters deal. $1.1 billion for 33,000 parking meters. Uh, the aldermen looked at the deal. They said yes, not a 100%, but 47 out of 50. And whether the deal turned out good or bad, can you imagine the challenge the mayor would have had to go up to every single alderman and say, in your ward in 37, would you please raise, we want to raise, we want to raise your, um, uh, your parking fees. Oh, no, you're not going to do that. Go to 38, go to 36. The only way you could have done it was if you did the whole city. There were mistakes that were made. Uh, it's unfortunate. But uh, in both the city and the lessor, lessee, Morgan Stanley, uh, infrastructure fund has paid a big price. Sorry, we're gonna have to go, probably have one, two more questions here, and then we're gonna have to end it, but I don't know if you have other engagements, um, people, oh, okay. people will be around um, oh, okay. after this, but I think we should try to formally end on time. Perhaps uh, this gentleman on the aisle and then the gentleman behind him with the second question. Really briefly, what's the rationale for um, signing these contracts for such long periods? Um, it actually Particularly the Chicago contracts. Chicago, and Chicago contracts yeah, the have been and the parking garage, which I believe in 99 years. You have an Indiana toll road lease, which is 75 years. It is better to have a shorter lease for every possible reason than a longer lease. Let's start off with that as a notion. However, there is an accounting rule that says that if you are going to depreciate an asset that you happen to buy, the lease term has to equate to the useful remaining economic life. So if the useful, remaining useful economic life is 65 years, that lease has to be at least 65, has to be 65 years for you as the lessee now to depreciate that asset, which you as a lessee will want to do so as to have be in the most advantageous tax position. It's a very, very clear and simple rule. Why does it go to 99 year leases? Because the people who were bidding on the Chicago lease, there were some that says we'll pay you a lot more money if you do a 99-year lease as opposed to a 65-year lease. They could have done two parallel bids, one for 65 and one for 99, to make sure that it was that much more, but they decided, let's just one, run one contest for 99 years. And that's the rationale. Okay, no pressure. This is the last question. Um, I was under the impression that tonight it was going to be creative ideas, meaning multiple ideas. So I understand this PPP idea. Is there another one? Let's see. Are we looking for them? Oh, so if we you have, have them, some. If you have some, please tell us. We would okay. love to hear about them. We, are, we do not have, not only do we have not have an exclusive on good ideas, we don't have a lot of them. But there are some things that just aren't new under the sun. Assets cost money. They are expensive. If you want good assets, 
that serve your customers and serve the users, they have to be paid for. How they get paid for? There are different methodologies, but there are not that many. And while I'd love to tell you that there is a magic bullet, a silver bullet, it doesn't exist. On the other hand, PPPs didn't exist to the degree that they do now. They didn't exist there 20 years ago. Um, there have been some interesting transactions that have been done, but if you're looking for the most fabulously creative new idea, we don't have them. If you have them, we want to hear about them. Don't be bashful. The defense pay for it. You just said their cost of capital zero. <laughs> and on that note, we will, uh, <laughs> we will close for this evening. Thank you all for coming and please join me.